Hey folks, in this video we are going to do a review of object-oriented programming, and this is something that you have most likely covered in CSE 1321, so um, hopefully most of this will be new, or not new to you, and so we're going to talk about all the different at attributes of object-oriented. We're going to cover how to define a class, how to define variables, how to define methods, what a constructor is, how you might have default constructors and overridden constructors, the difference between public, private, and protected, and also what a static variable is and how you might use a static variable. So lots to cover today. All right, so the first thing is object-oriented programming is based on the idea that there are real objects in the world. By this definition, I'm an object. Very specifically, I'm an instance of a teacher or an instructor, and I'm also an instance of a male and an instance of a person. Um, likewise, you have a car, perhaps, and perhaps that car is a Ford Mustang, Noteloo. So you have an instance of a car, and that particular car happens to be a Ford Mustang, and it happens to be blue, and it happens to have so many miles. So this is a way of thinking about programming such that you are dealing with things in a similar way to the way that they work in the real world. And that's desirable because it means that your code is a little bit more readable. You're thinking about how a car works, for example. And in that case, you have a car. It has the ability to drive. So it would have a drive method. It has the ability to slow down when you hit the brake. So that's going to be a brake method or a slow down method. You have the um, odometer, which tells you how many miles you have gone. Maybe you have a radio. Maybe you have all these other things. So there would be methods to do all of the different bits. And then there are attributes about your car. Your car is blue because it's blue. Or your car is a 2018 or 2012 or whatever year model it might be. And maybe it's the S variant or the TLS variant or whatever the variant is. Okay, so that's the general idea of why we do object-oriented programming. It is so that we think about things in the way that they exist in the real world. So there are two, two various words that you need to understand clearly. There is the idea of a class and the idea of an object. A class is the definition of what the object is going to be. So it's kind of the conceptual example of how it is. So for example, a, all vehicles are going to have the ability to have some number of wheels. So two wheels if it's a bicycle or a motorcycle, it's going to be four wheels if it's a, a car, it might be 16 wheels if it's a tractor trailer or whatever. So all of that will be defined in the class. And then when you instantiate the class and you actually make a particular vehicle, it will have a specific number of wheels, obviously. Um, and it will have specific attributes and specific things that it can have. So. The class is where you define what the objects are going to be like when they are actually created. It is the definition or the template, uh, if you will, of how the um, vehicles or whatever it is that you're making will be done. So um, we have a couple of things that can be in a class. Every class is going to have some form of a name. And generally, that name should be a generic title. So it's going to be something like animals or mammals or cars or weather or computer, right? It's going to be something that's pretty generic. When you make an example of that, your particular Ford Mustang in my example here, maybe you call that Ford Mustang Sally, I don't know. Um, and so at that point, it, the instance, the object of that has, a, has its own name and whatnot. But the generic name that you're going to have for the class in that case is still vehicle. So it's the name of the class that you're creating. You may have a bunch of variables in the class. And we actually call these attributes in object-oriented programming, but variable is another valid word for them. So these are just like variables that you have used up until now where you create you know, a variable called type and a variable called number of wheels and a variable called is crashed or whatever. And then you may have a bunch of methods. Um, methods is the fancy name for functions or behaviors, which are the things that this object is going to be able to do when it's instantiated. So classes will have a name, they will have attributes, and they will have methods. And of course, you could have a class that only has attributes and has no methods, but that would be kind of unusual. You could have a class that only has methods and has no attributes, but that would be unusual, but every class will have a name. All right. So here is our smallest class you can possibly define, class dog. Okay. Um, it has no, no meaning beyond that. Note this is identical in C Sharp and in Java. There is no syntax difference between the two. Okay, so what have we done when we did class dog? Well, we've created a complex data type. So up until now, we've dealt with primitive data types. We had things like var, um, cars, 
ints, longs, floats, doubles, booleans. Those were all primitive data types. This is a new data type called a dog, and we can now instantiate dogs off of this class. So think of it as a data type, effectively. It's the concept of a dog. And just like if you think about the primitive data types, when you say int, what is an int? Like until you actually assign it a number, it's just the concept of a number that has no decimal place after it. All right, so what is an object then? An object is when you take a class and you instantiate it. So it's a particular instance of that. So if we're dealing with the dog example, then dog has attributes. The attributes is number of legs, probably equal to four, unless they've had a terrible accident. Um, they have the ability to growl, they have the ability to eat, they have the ability to poo, um, they have the ability to reproduce, they have whatever other attributes a dog may have. Your particular dog will have its own name and it will have its own attributes as well. So not all dogs are the same. Some of them eat more, some of them weigh more, some of them are more aggressive, some of them are more you know, cuddly or whatever the word is, I don't know. So an object is an instance of a class. That's what you need to understand there. So you can have one class and then many instances of that class. So the class dog, there are millions of different dogs. Each one of those is an object. There are, you might have a class of employee for KSU and there are thousands of employees at KSU. So there's many instances of that or many objects. I know we're treating people as objects, but here we are. Um, each object has its own unique state. So if we go back to the dog example, um, my dog may be named Fluffy. Your dog may be main, named Growler. I don't know. Um, and so each dog is different insofar as it has its own actual state versus the class, which is just the generic definition. So that's very important to understand. So how do we go about making a dog? Well, let's talk about some attributes we're going to assign to a dog. So we might have whether the dog is rapid or not. It seems like a pretty... This got... This escalated quickly. Um, we have a weight, which is how heavy the dog is, and we have a name because the, all dogs are going to have a name. Dogs are going to be able to growl and they're going to be able to eat. Okay, so back to our skeleton of our class dog, we're going to have attributes. They're typically listed at the top. Technically, you can put them anywhere, but they're typically at the top. And then you're going to have all of your methods, which are your behaviors, which are going to be down below all of your attributes. So let's start filling them in. So we'll start off with a Boolean. Rapid, uh, sorry, rabbit, um, which we're setting to false because most dogs do not start off life as rabbit. Um, and then we're going to have our weight, which we're setting to 0, 0.0. And we're going to have a name, which right now we're setting to an empty string. All right, this is in Java. And the only reason that this is in Java is because the word Boolean is spelt out. And that is a capital S. Um, all right, so now that we have instant, or we have created the definition of what a dog might be, we have a couple of things that we might need to be able to do. So when a dog is born <laughs> in the real world, there are certain things that happen, right? The dog's weight is no longer zero. It has some weight. It's going to be different for every single dog when they're born. Some breeds are going to have a weight of one pound. Some breeds are going to have a weight of 20 pounds. Um, I don't actually know that. Is there such a thing as a dog that's born at 20 pounds? That would be a terrifying dog. But anyway, that's not important right now. So every instance that is created off of that class is going to have a specific weight. And so how does that get set? And the reason, that, or the way that that gets set is we're going to have what's called a constructor. A constructor is invoked, i.e. it is executed as soon as an object is created and it helps to construct the object as its name suggests. So inside of your constructor, you're going to write anything that you need to do in order to create a dog. So when the dog is born, it's going to need to have a weight assigned to it. It's probably going to be need to need to be set as not rabbit, and perhaps it's given a name, and we'll assume that that happens at birth. It may also get a name later on, or it may be renamed as time goes on. Like if the dog is, you know, given to somebody else or runs away, maybe it ends up with a completely new name. So there needs to be a method that's beyond the constructor for changing the name, perhaps, and we'll deal with that later on. But at birth, we're going to need to be able to do things. And this is not just unique to the dog example. This is true of anything. So when I was instantiated as a instructor here, um, attributes were set. There was a pay grade set for me and there was a KSU ID set for me and stuff like that. And so a constructor was called at the moment that I was created. All right, this is getting weird. Um, so a constructor is going to, it's a special method that is called automatically at the time that the um, object is instantiated. 
So to be clear, constructors are not called on classes. They are written in the class because the class is the definition of how things happen. But they're never executed in the class. They're only executed when an object is created, i.e. when you instantiate the class into an object. All right. So this happens when you use the keyword new, and we're going to see that in just a moment. Um, constructors in general do not have a return type. And what I mean by that is most methods that we have written, as a matter of fact, if you have watched the, the, um, the lecture that I recorded on methods, you'll remember in there I said all methods have a return type. Well, I lied to you. There is one example of methods that do not have a return type, and they are going to be constructors. Constructors don't return anything, they just set the object going. And as a matter of fact, you cannot set a return type on a constructor. It is wrong to do so. Um, so there you go. The name of the constructor is going to be the same as the name of the class. So when you name the class dog like we did, our constructor needs to be a method called dog that has no return value. All right, so what are you going to do in this constructor? We have to decide what a constructor is likely to do. So every time you make a class, you're going to have to decide what kinds of things people are going to do with your class. And so let's talk through a couple of questions here. So for our dog, are all dogs born in the same rabbit state? And uh, the argument here is yes, all dogs are born non-rabbit. Apparently, if they get bit and have rabies, again, this escalated really quickly. What's going on here? At some point, then they may become rabbit. But initially at birth, all dogs are non-rabbit. So there's no reason to ask the user when they're creating the object for the dog, whether they're rabbit or not. We can just assume that they're all rabbit, so, or they're all non-rabbit. So in that case, this constructor can just set a variable to false because in all cases the dogs are going to be false at birth or at instantiation. Are all dogs born with the same weight? Well, no, they're not. As I said before, different breeds, different weights. So that's something that we're going to need to be able to tell it at the time that it's creating the dog. So at the time that the object is being instantiated for each individual dog, we're going to be able to need to we're going to need to be able to set the weight. Are they all born with the same name? Obviously not, so we're going to need to be able to set the name as well. So anytime that we said no, then this is going to be a parameter that we're going to have to pass in to the constructor. All right, so here is an example of our constructor. So we started off with our class dog that we've seen before, and we said that he has, uh, the class has a couple couple of different attributes. We have rabbit, which is initially false, we have weight, and we have name. So now we're going to set our constructor. So as we see, the constructor is a method, and it is called dog, which is exactly the same as the name of the class. They have to be identical. That's non-negotiable. This method takes in two parameters. One of them is a float, which we're calling w, and one of them is a string, which we're calling n. And then all it does is it sets rabbit to false because it's always false. It sets the weight, which is this variable up here, to the w, which is what we got in here. And it sets the name, which is this variable up here, to the n, which we got in here. So to be clear, this constructor, when it's called, i.e. when we make an instance of this dog, they will all be called, or they will all be set as rabbit false. And whatever you pass in as your two arguments to that call are going to be set as the weight and the name. And then there may be additional things that we do down here. We'll deal with all of that later. The other thing to notice is that over here, the dog has no return, the, um, the constructor has no return type. I didn't say void dog. I didn't say int dog. I just said dog. All right, and that's very important. It's not a constructor if you put a type over there. All right, I'm going to explain something that I see people doing all the time. I see people put parentheses up here after the word dog in class, and that is always wrong. Classes do not have um, parameters directly up here. Down here, this is a method, and so methods always have parentheses. So classes, no parentheses, methods must have parentheses. So the being up here with parentheses is absolutely wrong, don't ever do that, but being down here in your parameter list, or sorry, in your constructor is going to be correct, and you're going to have a list of parameters in between there, possibly for your constructor. All right, hope that makes sense. Okay, so what can we do? Well, we're eventually going to need to define how the dog growls and how the dog eats, but we now have a dog. Um, at this point, we have a valid class called dog, and we can play around with it in our main algorithm. So your main algorithm in Java and in C-sharp are going to typically be in a separate file. 
So you generally have a main, um, excuse me, a main.java or a uh, main.cs if you're in um, C sharp. And then the classes are typically defined in other files. So if I go over to my little replit window here, um, you can see that in main.java, I have some information where I'm using my dog, but I separately have a dog.java that's in a separate file. And regardless of whether you're in Replit or whether you're in um, IntelliJ or in Eclipse or something else, you're usually going to be required to put each class in a file by itself. I will say in C Sharp, it will allow you to put all the classes in a single file, but it's still technically better to put them in separate files. It makes them a little bit easier to edit and find a particular method. And it just means that you're not paging through millions of pages of code trying to find something in some file. So it's nice to split them up even if you're not actually required in C Sharp. All right, so I have a dog.java. This is exactly what we were looking at on the um, on the slides. So uh, class dog, it has the three attributes that we were looking at a few moments ago. And uh, this is the constructor that we were just looking at, which takes in two parameters. I'll explain the other constructor here in a moment. All right, so your main file, your main.java, is always going to have a main method, and that's where Java begins. Um, and so that main method is typically written like this. It's going to be public static void main. And I think I've said before, but I'll say it again, that these words don't really matter right now. By the end of this presentation, I will have explained why both of these are here. But the main method is a void method. It returns nothing, and it can take in an argument for a string, which is just how you can pass stuff into the program. That's not important to this. All right, so let's take a look at what's happening when we call this. So I'm saying dog j1 comma j2 that's weird okay so dog is now a data type because i have defined it in a dog.java so you can see over here in my main i am quite happily able to say dog j1 and that is perfectly valid and it accepts that as dog is now a data type simply because i have a dog.java which has a class dog in it all right so what does this actually do if i just say dog j1 j2 well, it creates two variables, one called j1 and one called j2, and right now they both point to null. So to be clear, we haven't actually created a dog yet. We've just made a variable that is of type dog that at some point we might actually instantiate. So think of this, I suppose, as the delivery room where you know there's a dog coming, but it's not actually here yet. So right now you don't have a dog, but at some point in the future, you're pretty sure you're going to be dealing with a dog. So you've declared two dogs. Um, you could say that these dogs are currently dead because there's no actual dog there yet. This really did escalate quickly. But anyway, so this brings us to the new keyword. So let's do that quickly. So this brings a object to life effectively. And it's going to call the constructor and it opens up enough space in memory to actually fit the dog. So to be clear, if I go back a slide and I take a look at this again, right now no memory has been allocated. If I looked at the size of the memory of my program, nothing has changed before and after this line because I haven't actually used any memory yet. Until I call new, there is no dog, therefore there is no memory actually being used. All right. So let's step through what's going to happen as we go through this. So this is still my main method. It's the same as before, and I have my dog j1, j2. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a new line where I'm going to say j1 equals new dog, and then I'm going to pass it as parentheses two things. All right, now let's talk through this again for just a moment. So j1 is the name of my variable up here, which up until now has really had nothing in it. The moment that I call new, what's going to happen is it's going to generate some memory allocation for j1. So instead of it pointing to null as it previously was, it's going to allocate a chunk of memory in the computer and it's going to say this is of type dog. It will be of the size that it needs to be to hold all the things that a dog is going to have based on what you defined in your class. When I called uh, new or when I called new and I passed it dog, I'm effectively calling the constructor here. So I'm calling the method dog inside of the class dog, which is a little confusing, and I'm passing it two parameters, which are 14 and Bob. So if we take a look at that constructor that we had earlier, you'll notice that the 14 lines up with this W and the Bob lines up with this N because effectively that's what's happening here. So the dog constructor is going to be called 
and it received as two parameters, one of them was the number 14, and one of them was the string Bob. So W is equal to 14, N is equal to Bob, and then in its code it says rabbit equals false, because all dogs are not rabbit at birth, and then weight, which was the variable that we had set, or the attribute that we had set at the top of the class definition, is equal to W, which at this point is 14, so that sets the weight to 14, and and name equals n sets the name to Bob. So if we look over in this memory block over here, we can see that J1 is now pointed to a block of memory that effectively has these three things in it. It has the attribute for rabbit, the attribute for weight, and the attribute for name, and they are each appropriately set to what we told the constructor. J2 is still hanging out over here. We know there's a J2 coming, but it hasn't actually popped out yet. So let's do something with J2. So again, we're going to call new on J2. And so the way that that's going to work is the same as before. J2 is suddenly going to be pointed to a block of memory. And then the constructor is going to be called and numbers are going to be passed in. And you can, same thing is going to happen. They're going to get filled in. Now I need you to understand here, the reason that we're showing you this memory is because J1 and J2 are both of type dog but they have completely different variables inside of them. So J2's weight is seven, whereas J1's weight is 14. And for the duration of J1's life, their weight will be 14 and their name will be Bob unless somebody changes it, regardless of what happens to J2. So we can do anything we want over here and it's having no effect on this one. They are completely separate things. And that's why we were thinking of them as if they were data structures. Because remember when you create an integer, Unless you change the value of the integer, it stays that value for as long as it exists in the program. So that's very important. All right, so let's add some attributes to this dog so that he can do um, some additional stuff. So um, we're going to add an attribute, or sorry, a method called eat. And this is going to be a little bit weird. So what we're going to do is we're going to take in an amount of food and we're simply going to add to their weight the amount of food. And then we're going to print out they now weigh this amount. All right, so yes, this is obviously silly because that's not how food works. I mean, technically, I guess it is. If you eat two pounds of food and you immediately weigh yourself, I would assume you are two pounds heavier. I think. I don't know. I'm not a biologist. We're just here to talk about classes. So eat is going to get called. It's going to take in a parameter when it's called, and it's going to add that to the current weight. So notice that weight is not defined inside of this method. Like I didn't take it in, excuse me, I didn't take it in as an attribute or as a um, parameter. So where is this weight? Well, it's in the object. So remember each object has its own copy of all of those variables that we declared at the top of the class. So when we say that the class has a weight and a name and a Boolean called rabbit, every instance that is created of that class will have those variables. And inside that class, if you write a method, such as this method called eat, you can access and you can change those variables, which is exactly what's happening here. Weight is being added to by the amount of food. All right, and we also added a method called growl, which of course just prints out grr, grr, because that's apparently what dogs say, not wolf. Yep, there we go. All right, this method returns a void, so does this one. They could absolutely return a, um, a data type, so that's just a particular thing about eating and growling. Neither of those things actually return anything. Okay, so that brings us to the dot operator. So the dot operator has a couple of different purposes, really. It's how you access a attribute inside of an object. It's how you access a method inside of an object. It's basically how you get into the instance or the object. You call the, ob the object's name dot and then either the attribute or the method, which is what we're showing you down here. So let's take a look at a little bit more specific code. So this is our main method again. This is not in the dog.java, this is in our main.java. So these are the two lines and all I did was I combined something that we had done earlier. We had dog j1 and then separately we said j1 gets new dog. You can absolutely do that all on one line. Dog j1 gets new dog, dog j2 gets new dog and we're calling two different constructors here and I will explain that in just a moment. All right. So down here is where we're actually accessing some of the variables in there. So I'm saying j1.eat, and then I'm passing it the number two. So j1 is one of my two dogs, 
and I'm calling dot eat on that dog, and I'm passing it the number two. So if we look at that method for eating back here, we can see that I had to pass it a number, which was supposed to be a float, two is valid as a float, and we're adding that to the weight of j1. So after we call that method, we are going to suddenly have our weight be higher. Likewise, I can call growl, and as you can see, growl, excuse me, growl does not take any parameters, and that's because we didn't specify that it takes any parameters. So I can simply say j2.growl, and I can say j1's name is now fluffy, and I can say j1 eat, and I can say j1 eat negative one. All right, so let's see what all those things do over in our replit here. So this is that same code that was just on the slide. When I created the dogs, one thing that's slightly different from the slide is I did give j1 a name, and I gave it an initial weight of 14. So we're just gonna run this over here, and we can see that um, initially, j1 has a weight of 14. As soon as I call eat on it, it's going to now have a weight of 16. Uh, when I call growl on j2, we see that ethel says grr, and that's because j2's name is ethel. Um, I set j1's name to fluffy, which I did by just setting it as a variable. So note that that is a, a attribute that I am setting there. I'm saying j1.name is equal to fluffy. And then I called eat on j1, so it said fluffy now weighs 20 pounds, because fluffy used to weigh 16. And then I called j2 um, uh, dot eat on negative one, which I think the dog just puked. Um, a pound of food? Okay, so anyway, j1 eat negative one obviously means that they used to be seven pounds and now they're six pounds. Probably should seek medical attention, but that's not important right now. All right, so the important part of this slide is that the dot operator allows you to call a method inside an object, and it also allows you to access an attribute inside an object. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about the constructor, and we've said that constructors uh, can have parameters passed into them. Um, even if you create a method, or sorry, if you create a class that doesn't have a constructor, there's actually automatically going to be one there for you. And that's very strange. All classes implicitly have a default constructor, whether you want it or not. And what the default constructor does is it sets any attributes that there are in the class to whatever their default value is. The default value for all numbers is going to be zero, the default value for all booleans is going to be false, and the default for any other object is going to be null, so all strings are going to be set to null. Uh, characters are set to an empty character, and so on and so forth. So a default constructor is there whether you want it or not, and it's invisible. It doesn't automatically show up in your code. So if you could see the default constructor, what would it actually look like? And that's what this is here. So to be clear, whether this block of code is here or not, this will work exactly the same way when I instantiate it and make a dog. So this is the same as before. It's my class dog and I have my attributes down here. But what I'm saying is you can write a default constructor that sets rabbit equal false, weight equal zero, and name equal null. Or you could actually choose to not bother writing that block of code and everything will work the same because both Java and C Sharp will create a default constructor for you that does exactly that. So you might say, well, then why would you ever write it? Well, the answer is because most of the time these are not the right answers. The default values are sometimes correct and you can rely on it, but more often than not, you probably don't want a dog named Null. You're probably going to want the dog to be able to have a name. So either you're going to need to have a constructor that takes in a name and then sets the dog's name, or you're going to need to have a method that allows you to change the dog's name, like a getter or a setter, which we're gonna talk about here in just a moment. Okay, so the important part of this slide is that there is a default constructor there, whether you want it or not. If you don't write a constructor called dog that takes in no parameters, it will automatically do one for you, and it will set all variables to their default state. If you want to do something other than that, then you need to create a default constructor which takes in no parameters and sets things to whatever you want them set to. Okay, so this brings us to the next topic, which is that a given class can, and almost always, or not almost always, but a lot of the time is going to have more than one constructor. Why? Because sometimes you're going to want the constructor to do more than one thing, depending on how the dog is instantiated. So <laughs> this just keeps getting weirder and weirder. If the dog is my dog, then I want to make sure it has a name and it has a good weight and all the rest. 
But if it's a generic dog that I don't care about, which there are none of those because I love dogs, but presuming that there's a generic dog that I don't care about, maybe those all get named, you know, dog one. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so let's take this away from the dog example because this is obviously silly. If you're instantiating employees at KSU, you might need to be able to set their KSU ID at the moment that they're hired, i.e. instantiated, but you also may not be able to do that for other reasons. There may be dependencies like they haven't gone to get their talent card yet, and therefore the KSU ID hasn't been set. So depending on the circumstances in the real world, there may be two different ways that you would instantiate employee at KSU. And because of that, you may need two different constructors. One that tells you, or one that takes in a parameter that is the KSU ID and sets it right there and then at the time they're created, and another one that doesn't take the KSU ID but then there's a method that allows you to set it later on. So there's no reason that you can only have one constructor. There's no reason it can only be two. You could have 500 different constructors. That would be very unusual. Most of the time you will either have one constructor, two constructors, maybe three constructors. That's probably as much as you're going to have most of the time. All right, so it is possible to have more than one constructor. And the technical term for this, which you need to definitely etch into your brain, is called overloading. There is another word we are going to deal with at some point, which is called overriding, and that does something totally different. I will tell you, this is a very, very common interview question. It is a very common question on tests. You definitely need to learn this word. The word overloading means that you have more than one method that takes different parameters that do different things. It's the same method name, but it has different parameters coming in. So in the example of our dog, we might have a constructor, which is a method called dog that takes no parameters, and a constructor called dog, which takes two parameters. That is an overloaded constructor. There are two different methods with the same name, but they take different parameters. So the parameters are what decide which one of those methods are going to be called. So how does it know which one to call? So let's take an example here. So we have class BMW Z4, and it has a model year, and it has a license plate, and it has a Boolean top of it. All right, so in this case, this has two constructors. So first off, how do I know that this is a constructor? Well, because the name of the method matches the name of the class, and there is no return type. It is a method, because it has parentheses, so there's a method that matches the name of the class with no return type, this is a constructor. But this is also a constructor. It is another method, there is no return type, the name also matches the name of the class, and this one takes in a parameter. So this is a constructor, and this is a constructor. They are both constructors. And we would say, correctly, that this is an overloaded constructor because there is a different set of parameters that come in. So when I instantiate my class and I make an object of type BMW Z4, I can either pass it an empty parameter list, in which case I will get a 2004 non-top-up with a license plate that says dealer, or I can instantiate it and pass it a year, and at that point I will have one where the variable or the attribute model year is actually set correctly to the year. I can call this object I can instantiate this object in two different ways. So when I call the new method, I will get two different things. Um, this, I have mostly been showing you code in Java up until now, but let me be clear, there really is no difference between these two. The way that you call the methods, the types of the parameters, all of that is exactly the same. The only reason that we're gonna show you the um, C-sharp code is because that particular thing right there is going to change. String becomes lowercase, and Boolean is not fully spelled out. But other than that, if I flip back and forth between these, you can see literally nothing else changes and those are both valid code. So just to be clear for our C-sharp folks. So how does this get called? Well, I could say BMW Z4, which is the name of my class, and that is now a data type. My car, which is a variable name, gets new BMW Z4, and note that I passed it no parameters. So in that case, what's going to happen is it is going to call this one. Why? Because this one has no parameters. So my car that I'm calling my car is going to have a model year of 2004 because I didn't specify one. However, if I make another object called your car, 
and I pass it 2007 as a parameter at the time that I call new, then all of a sudden your car will have a model year of 2007, whereas my car still has a model year of 2004. Okay, and likewise her car is going to have a model year of 2008. So this is a valid statement, and this is a valid statement, and this is a valid statement, and that's weird because these are quite different from each other. In one case I'm passing no parameters, in the other case I am passing a parameter. Now, if I were to call it with two parameters, perhaps I said 2007 comma false or 2007 comma three, it would error because there is no matching constructor that takes two parameters in this code. There's a constructor with zero parameters and a constructor with one parameter. Those are your choices. If you try to do anything else, you're gonna get an error. So the code that you write in the class has to match how you instantiate it at the time that you create the objects in your main method. So that's super important. All right. Oh yeah, I, one more thing there. Um, this is an integer, 2007, and this is an integer. That's also very important. If I were to try and put a floating point number in here, you're also going to get an error. It literally has to match. You have to pass an int to an int, otherwise it doesn't know which constructor to call because there is no constructor here, even with one parameter, that takes in a float. So if I had said 2007.3, then this would error because there is nothing that takes in a floating point. Um, the error would be something along the lines of, you're trying to cast a floating point number to an integer and that will result in loss of data and cannot be done or something like that. It varies obviously between Java and C sharp. Okay, so constructors. You can have none, at which point you get the default constructor and it sets all the variables to whatever their default state is, zeros, falses, and nulls. You can have one constructor, in which point you would say that constructor generally would have no parameters if you're only going to have one, and that constructor will then have the ability to set particular um, variables to whatever you specify in the default constructor that you wrote. You can have two constructors that have different sets of parameters. Those would be considered overloaded constructors because you have the same method with two different parameter sets, and they will be called whenever. As one more point, if you had written only one constructor and it took in one parameter, then the default constructor is there still and will fire if it is called. So if I had in this block of code not written this, so let's imagine that all of that code is just not there, and I call this first line where I call it without a parameter, it will work and it will call the default one, which will set model year to zero top up to false and license plate to null because that code is there even though it's not visible, I didn't write it, it is always there. So that's why we're saying the default constructor is always there and can always be called. You can always instantiate an object even if you've never written a constructor for that class. If you write a constructor and it only takes in one parameter and you call a constructor that has no parameters but you didn't write a code that has no parameters, it will call the default one and set everything to the default values. All right. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. So we're gonna move on and we're gonna talk about some other stuff. I will say this is a good place to pause the video and go back and rewatch that first part if you're not clear on that. I will be honest with you, these concepts are going to keep coming up throughout the semester. You are going to need to know how to write a class. You are going to need to know how to put attributes into that class, how to make methods in that class, how to create a constructor for that class, and how to call all of those things. You're gonna need everything after this as well, but if you're not clear on that, pause the video now, go back, and then come back to this point. All right, so presuming you're back, we're now going to talk about the visibility of things inside the class. So when I define a class, the reason that I'm doing that is because I'm setting attributes of each of those objects. So in the example of our dog, our dog has an age perhaps. And you might think, well, nobody ever sets their age. At the time that the dog is created, they're zero. And every 365 days, we plus one to that age. And there's not really much else to it. You can't suddenly make the dog younger or older. I mean, I guess you could by, yeah, we're not gonna go there. But you can't change the age of the dog. It's something that just automatically happens. So how would that work with the case of an object for a dog? Well. It implies that no one should ever be able to set the attribute age. And you would say, okay, but no one should ever do that. So why is this a big deal? Well, 
generally in object-oriented programming, I'm going to write the class and I'm probably never going to be the one who instantiates it and actually uses it in a big company. So think about it this way. This is all very, very simple. We're just dealing with a dog. But let's talk about something like Microsoft Word or Google Docs, um, uh, whatever the Google Docs equivalent of Microsoft Word is. Doc, is that what it's called? Um, so if you think about how much stuff happens inside of your word processor, there are thousands of functions you can call. So like there's a spell checker. And when you call the spell checker, it walks through your entire document and spell checks everything. Well, that's probably a set of classes. Even the spell checker has lots of different options. You could be writing a document in English or in Spanish or in French or in some other language. And so in those cases, there's probably a separate class that has to deal with each one of those languages because the rules are different sometimes, especially for the grammar checker. The grammar checker for English and the grammar checker for French are quite different. Um, if you're crazy like me and you came from Ireland, um, in Gaelic, the verb always comes at the beginning of the sentence. So you would say, walk me to the shop I did. It's like Yoda. So yeah, the grammar checker is going to be very, very different for each of those. So you would have a set of classes, one of which is the wrapper for how to do spell checking and how to do grammar checking. And then underneath it, there'd be a lot of little classes for doing English and French and German and Italian and Chinese and every other language that you might need to be able to do that for. And likewise for the grammar checker. So that's not all written by one person. There's probably a team of 100 people that work on the spell checker. Okay, probably not 100 people anymore because it's mostly written, but there's a team of some number of people who do that. So somebody wrote those classes. The person who wrote the whole interface for Word or the, or the team that did that, they don't need to know the details of how the spell checker works. They just know that there's going to be a button and when you mash that button, it's going to spell check things. So somebody different is going to use your class. So when you write your class, you have to be very mindful about what you want them to be able to call and what you want them to be able to change. So back to the example of our dog, we would make sure that nobody can set the age of the dog. That's not something that should happen. So we would want to protect the attribute age as something that is not directly changeable in the outside. Okay, so I'm going to flip back a couple of slides here, and I'm going to show you when we were talking about the dot operator that we went in and we changed the name of J1. It was right here. I said J1.name equals Fluffy. So to be clear, name is an attribute in the class dog, which I instantiated as J1, and then I just went in and I changed it. And that's generally not a good coding style. I probably shouldn't be directly changing attributes inside of an object. What's better is I probably should be calling a method that allows me to adjust it. So rather than allowing you to directly change the age of, of the dog, what would be better is if there's a method that says increment the dog's age by one year. And that method can only be called once a year. And it checks that if you try to call it more than once a year, it errors and says, I don't know what you're trying to do, but no, all right? Likewise, it shouldn't allow you to pass at a negative number. It should only allow you to go forward because it turns out dogs can't go backwards. So my point is there should be a method that you call that actually makes the changes to the or to the attributes and does some error checking along the way to make sure you're not doing something completely crazy. So if we come back to where we were in the slides here, um, this is done through the keywords public and private. There's another keyword called protected that you'll see in some languages, but public and private are what we're going to talk about here. So in this case, the age should be set as private. So at the time that I define the variable age, which is an integer at the top of my dog class, I would say private int age. Once I do that, nobody outside of that class is ever allowed to change it. What do I mean by that? I mean, if anybody instantiates the class dog and they try to do j1.age equals seven, it will error. Very specifically, you will get an error that says you are trying to access a private variable or something along those lines. You do not have appropriate permissions. This is a protected variable. Um, so it stops anyone who would use my class from going in and just messing with the age. So if I'm going to do that, then I now need to provide some method for people to be able to modify the age. So I might have a method called increment age, which is a public method that is allowed to be called from outside of my object. 
So you will call increment age, and then internally inside my object, it will figure out what that really means. Okay, so public and private are keywords that are used as you're defining the class. Attributes, or IE variables, and methods, IE the functions, can each independently be set as public and private. As a matter of fact, even classes can be set as public and private, and we'll get to that a little bit later on. But for now, very important that you understand when you define attributes, they can be either set as public or they can be set as private. And likewise, when you define methods, they can be set as public or private. Most of the time, you would want your attributes private. And most of the time, you would want your methods public. But there might be circumstances where you would want a private method. This would be something that happens inside the class that you don't ever want anyone outside the class messing with, but you would yourself need to be able to do something. And like, again, in our dog example, maybe the thing that increments the age shouldn't be public. Maybe it actually should just happen inside the attribute where every day it wakes up and checks what's the date. And if it's more than 365 days since the last time we changed it, we go ahead and add one to the age. And that's just a private method that only can be fired inside of the um, object. All right. So if you set something as public, anyone inside your class or outside your class can change it, whether that be an attribute or a method. They can call the method or they can change the attribute. If you set it as private, it can only be accessed inside your class. So there better be a method or some other code in there that allows you to do that. Variables and methods and classes can all be marked as public or private, as I said before. So generally, variables private, methods public. So let's take a look at our um, class here again. So we have our class BMW Z4, and let's talk about each of those attributes that we had. So we had a model year, and let's talk about what we would want for that. I, I would think that the model year should probably be private. It's not something that everybody should be changing, and it's probably only set at the time that the BMW Z4 is instantiated. It should never be changed past that. The license plate Maybe we make that visible, public. Why? Well, because it turns out that license plates change. Um, if you, for whatever reason, renew it, sometimes they reprint the license plates. I think Georgia has stopped doing that, but it used to be that every 10 years or every seven years, they came out with a new design and everyone got a new plate and a new number. Um, so that is something that might have to change. So therefore, either you would make it public or you would create a method for updating it. And then top up is also a private variable I'll be honest with you, I have no idea what top-up is. Are we talking about like a retractable top? That's my guess. Okay. Um, all right. Our methods down here, we have the ability to drive. Well, that better be public. <laughs> Otherwise, this is not a very useful car. If you have a car and the method for driving is private, that means no one can ever drive the car, which is not particularly helpful. Um, open the top, which is what obviously retracts the roof, now that I understand what top-up is. Um, that is public because you would want people to be able to open and close it. Um, emits pollution when no one's looking. Yeah, that probably should be private. Okay, so let's take a look at all of these things. So we, we said at the time that we are defining the my car variable, which is of type BMW Z4, there is no actual car. Now we go ahead and we create a car. It is of type BMW Z4. I'm calling the default constructor. And I am making a variable, I am setting that to my variable my car, which is of type BMW. This brings my car to life. I now own a BMW Z4. At that point, I'm going to try and set the license plate. So if we go back and we look at our previous slide, we had decided that the license plate, the license plate was public. Therefore, I would be able to do that. So in my car dot license plate, I can set it to my license plate number. If I try to do my car dot model year equals 2018, I'm going to get a compiler error. Why? Because I set model year as private back over here. So this will not work. It will not allow me to do that. I can, however, say my car dot drive. I'm clearly calling a method here because there's parentheses. And I can call my car dot open top. Both of those are perfectly legal. But if I try to call my car dot emit pollution when no one's looking, that's not plausible because it's marked as private. So again, once you instantiate the object, which is what we're doing up here, 
you can call the public methods and you can change the public variables or attributes. You cannot call the private methods and you cannot change any private attribute. So if we have these private variables, um, such as our um, age, how do we go about setting them or changing them at any point? Well, you're going to need to provide a method that people can call. That method is going to need to be a public method, and whether it returns something or not, that's up to you, basically. Um, in this case, it's going to be a void because, well, we're just setting an age, so it doesn't actually return anything. It could return a Boolean that it was successful or not successful, or it maybe returns a string that says, I am now seven or whatever. Yay, happy birthday, whatever. Um, all right, so my method is going to be called setAge. There's nothing magical about the word set here. I could absolutely call it Fred, and it's going to take in one parameter, which is an integer, and that's our age. All right, so the whole point of doing this method, as opposed to just letting somebody on the outside calling, and sorry, somebody from outside of your object just directly changing the age variable, is that in this case, we're going to be able to do some checking to make sure that what they asked us to do is reasonable. Okay, now this particular checking is maybe not that reasonable, but what we're saying is if the age is less than 110, allow this to set it. All right, so for a dog, I don't think you can ever be 110, but for a human, 110 is pretty close to as old as you can be, I think. Maybe the oldest person is 115 or so at this point. I don't know, whatever. Anyway, so you can implement whatever rules. And what rules might you implement for a dog? So it might be if the new age is less than 25, allow it. It might be if the new age is greater than zero, allow it. Um, in addition to being less than 25, so between 0 and 25, because you can't have a dog that's negative 1 and you really can't have a dog that's 50 years old. Um, so those are checks. You might also need to check that what they gave you was actually an integer. Now, the compiler is going to keep track of that for you because what you took in is an integer, but if you were taking in a string, you might need to do some checking on it to make sure that what you got is actually in the format that you expect it to be or whatever else. So the point of this method is instead of allowing the person outside of your object to directly change attributes inside of it, you're providing them a method that allows them to change it, but you get to make sure that they're not doing something dumb. All right, and so these are a class of methods called setters or modifiers. You're going to hear them frequently called setters, and you're going to hear another type of a method called getters, which do a similar task, but they, as you might guess, get the value of a met of a attribute. So, to be clear, if you have a private attribute inside of your class, you will need to provide, most likely, a way for people outside of your object to be able to set and or get those values. You will typically do that with getters and setters. In Java, you'll name the getters and setters whatever you want to name them. In C Sharp, they actually have a very specific name and I'll see that, I'll show that to you in just a second. The main reason for doing this is so that you can prevent bad data. You can guarantee that the state of your object is always valid. Its age is somewhere between zero and 25 or whatever you decide are the appropriate parameters. All right, so let's take a look at our example here. So this is our class BMW Z4 again, and we have a couple of va variables up here. Um, so we have our model year, we have our license plate, and we have our top up, and all three of these are currently marked as private. So if we're going to do that, then we are going to need a getter and a setter pair for the year, a getter and a setter pair for the license plate, and a getter and a setter pair for the top up. So to be clear, the setter for the model year is a method that returns void because it's just setting something. We're calling it set model year. Um, it takes in a year and it sets model year to that year, which makes sense. The getter is going to return an integer because of course the model year is an int. So it doesn't take in any parameters because if you're getting the value of the model year, then why would you take in a parameters? And it's simply going to return the model year. And the same thing is happening down there. These are the absolute minimum that you would have to do in order to provide getters and setters. To be clear, this probably should have an if statement around it that says if the model year is greater than, you know, 1910 when the first uh, car came into existence and it's less than the current date because you can't have a model year much more than one year in the future because you can technically buy a 2022 car right now, I think. Um, if you're watching this in 2021, it's usually one year later. All right, so these are um, attributes, uh, getters and setters. If we're doing this, in C Sharp, there's a handy little shortcut that they permit. This is only for C Sharp people. This does not work in Java. But over here, when you define your public int model year, underneath it, you can put curly braces and you can say get 
and then give it the definition of how to get, set, give it the definition of how to set. And so this allows you, the, note that it doesn't really have a method name. This is again, just a clever little shortcut. You will sometimes see get semicolon, set semicolon, and you'll get the default getter and setter, which the default getter just returns the value and the default setter just sets the value. So you can actually abbreviate all of this to public int model year, open curly brace, get semicolon, set semicolon, close curly brace. And that will provide for you a getter and a setter for that model year that are inherently public without having to code this exact thing because this is obviously a very small pointless code. In reality, you should have checks in your setter that are making sure that they're doing something useful. Because honestly, if all you're doing is this, then why did you make it private? You might as well have just made it public if you're not even checking that they're giving you something useful. Okay, so that is the talk of getters and setters. And uh, we're going to move on to um, a topic, which is this and self. So this is a keyword that is used when you have a weird circumstance. So I'm going to go back to our dog example. So we're back in class dog and we have our rabbit and our weight and our um, uh, name. And I'm going to write a constructor. And when I'm writing the constructor, I'm going to say dog and I'm going to take in three parameters because we have three values. And I'm going to call the first one rabbit and the second one weight and the third one name because that what makes sense to me when I'm writing the constructor. And then I go to actually implement it and I end up with this really weird thing. So the variable rabbit up here, I want to set it to the value that was passed in that I called rabbit. Huh? Because effectively what I said is rabbit equals rabbit, which actually doesn't do what you think it does. It's going to just set this variable to itself, which is not useful. So these three statements are an error. To be clear, this slide is wrong. You should not ever do this. There are two solutions to this problem. Don't call the parameter the same name as you call it up here. And if you think back to our earlier example, what I said was float w and string n, and that just allowed you to then say weight equals w, name equals n, and that's a valid way to do it. The other valid way to do it is this, and the keyword this allows you to set this particular class's rabbit to the variable that you came in in this. So. To be clear, this is a parameter rabbit, and those two are the same. Likewise, those two are the same, and likewise, those two are the same. Okay, but when I say this dot rabbit, I'm referring to this one up here. The keyword this means you're dealing with this object's rabbit, not the rabbit that you got in as a parameter. So this is valid syntax, and it is the way you must do it if you are going to do a constructor or any method where you're going to use the same variable name as the class has. So your choice, either don't do that or use this. Okay, moving on from there, the next thing that we're going to talk about is chaining constructors. So when you write multiple constructors, you're going to find that they often are doing the same thing. And rather than having to rewrite the same code over and over again, you can chain one to the next. Let me explain what that means. So let's take a look at our dog class again. And same exact parameters, none of that has changed. And we have our handy dandy little constructor that we just looked at down here at the bottom, which takes in our three parameters and it sets the three appropriate things. Well, let's imagine that I also want to have a default constructor that doesn't take in any parameters, but sets the variables to specific things like false four for the weight and fluffy for the name. Well, rather than having to rewrite out in here, this dot rabbit equals false, this dot weight equals four, this dot name equals fluffy, I can simply use this other constructor down here. I can call it inside of this constructor. So to be clear, this constructor might get called if no parameters are passed. And in that case, when this constructor is called, it is going to call the other constructor that takes three parameters. And the shortcut for doing that is you say this. You can't just say dog, that doesn't do what you think it does. You're gonna wanna say this and then pass it the three parameters. What parameters are you passing it? Well, whatever this other constructor takes in. So after this first param or this first constructor was called, which takes no parameters, 
it then is going to realize that it needs to find a constructor that takes three, where the first one's a Boolean, the second one's a float or an integer, and the third one is a string, and then it's going to call that. So good news on that. All right, the last topic in today's presentation is the keyword static. And again, this is another good place to pause the video and go back and review because this is kind of a slightly separate topic. The keyword static implies that you are not talking about an object's variable, you're talking about a class variable. Hmm. Okay, so let's talk about why. So if you're familiar with this, every single car that's created in the world has what's called a VIN number, a VIN, a vehicle identification number. It's usually, if you look at your dashboard right underneath your um, windshield, it's usually on a metal tag right at the end of there. And it is unique to every car in the world. Every single car has a separate VIN, unless somebody has done something illegal. Um, and how do you keep track of that? Well, each manufacturer has a first few digits that they use, and then they just increment every time they make a car. Um, and they, they can choose to do other things, like they could mean that the first five digits represent the manufacturer, and the next three digits is the model, and then the next ten digits is the actual instance of the car or whatever. Those are made up things. You can go look it up on the internet as to how the VIN numbers are actually done. But there is a VIN number, and it is unique to every car. So that is something that would be set in an object. So if each individual car is an object, it would need to be set. But you would also have to keep track of what was the last one that was used ever. And that's not an individual attribute to each object. You don't want to have to, at the time that you go to create the next car on the production line, go and query every single car in the world and figure out what is the next number. That would be terrible. So you kind of need a global variable, if you will, that is kept track of for all cars, or at least all of your cars, as to what the last number that was used. And that will be a great example of a class variable. It's a variable that is not for the objects, but it's for the whole of the class. And that would be called a static attribute. It is not changed in the, in the individual objects. It is only there inside of the class. And that's why it's called static, because it's not part of the objects which change each one. Every object has its own name and its own weight and its own rabbit statement and its own, um, you know, whether the top opens or not. But a static variable is something that is true of every car that is made. It is defined in the class car or in the class dog or in the class whatever, and it is marked as static. So this is good for counting how many instances you have of something. The VIN number is a great example of that, but it may also be that you want to know how many dogs you currently have. And so that would be kept as a static variable, num dogs. All right, so how do we go about doing this? So up here in our um, class dog, we're going to say static int dog counter equals zero. And this is the zero, there are zero dogs in the world right now at the time that I start this world. Once people start making dogs, so they go down here and they say dog1, um, or sorry, dog d1 equals new dog, then at this point, the constructor for dog gets called, and something that's happening in the dog constructor is we're giving the dog an ID, and we're doing a plus plus on the dog counter. Okay, so a lot happened here. I called new dog, the constructor gets fired. The constructor matches, there's no parameters, there's no parameters, life is good. So this is going to change a private variable called dog ID, which every dog is going to have their own copy of because that does not say static. This is just like everything was before I mentioned the word static. This is just a private variable called dog ID. And so it's setting the dog ID for this instance of the dog to the following number, which is dog counter plus plus. Well, if you remember, plus plus has the effect of adding one to uh, the current value. So the first dog that is created will be dog zero because effectively dog ID will be equal to dog counter which right now is zero and then the plus plus will fire which will change dog counter to one. To be clear it changes dog counter to one in the class because this is a static variable. It does not change it in each individual dog. Each individual dog has their own ID so this dog is indeed dog zero, and this dog is indeed dog one. And that happened automatically because the static variable got incremented after the first one was made. So 
a static variable or a static attribute is a attribute that is specific to the class, not to the individual objects, but to the class. And when it is changed, it is changed in the class, not in the individual objects. All right, so hopefully that makes some sense here. There are a few rules when you deal with the word static. You can make call, or you can call methods like normal, meaning that you can call whatever you want with the following rules. You don't have to create an instance to call that method. All right, so what does that mean? If I made a method in here, we'll say growl, probably a terrible example. That method can be called even if I have never made a dog because static methods, just like static variables, are part of the class, they are not part of the object. So if I have a static method growl, then I can call growl. And again, terrible example, but you can probably think of something that has something to do with a dog that would be true of all dogs in the world. Don't know. Don't like whistles. I got nothing. Hate mailman. All right. You cannot access non-static attributes inside of a static method. So if I have a static method down here, I cannot change dog ID. And if you think about that for just a second, it makes sense. If I can call this static method, even before I've instantiated a dog, then what would I be setting or changing up here? It doesn't exist. These variables, if they are not labeled as static, only exist in instances of the dog, only exist in objects. If they are marked as static, they exist in the class. So static methods can only deal with static attributes because it doesn't make sense otherwise. All right? And the way that you call them is the same as anything else. You say class name dot the method name. So here's a better example. And so we have um, our dog counter, which is zero, and it is marked as static. So that's specific to all dogs. Oops. Um, we have our private dog ID, which that should have an int in there. I'm going to correct that um, on the slides after this. And um, we have a constructor, which does the same thing as before. It sets dog ID to um, dog counter plus plus. And then we have a static method called allowed, which sets dog counter equal to star two, multiplies the current dog counter by two. And in here, just to prove something, we're trying to do not allowed, which sets the dog ID to 10. And the reason that that's not allowed is because the dog ID is not static. So this is a static method and I'm trying to access a non-static attribute and that is not permitted. So this will not compile, this will cause errors. This perfectly valid, not really sure what its point is, but it is perfectly valid. All right, so this has been a bumper lecture. And honestly, these are concepts that you really need to understand. We have what are attributes inside of a class, we have the definition of a class in the first place. We have constructors. We had overloaded constructors where you have more than one constructor with different parameter lists. We had methods, which are similar to constructors, but they actually return a value and they're not automatically invoked when you're created. We have um, the fact that a class is basically a template for creating objects and those objects are effectively a new data type whereas an object is an instance of a class and it has some of its own state variables that are independent from each one. Variables mostly should be declared private. Methods typically are declared public. Other methods for local use should be private if you have any of them. Control access to your variables so that you're making sure that people aren't doing crazy things with your variables. And you would probably need getters and setters anytime that you are dealing with a private variable. So that completes this review. If any of this didn't make sense, I'll by all means go back and relook at it. Um, the replet that I used in this review, which has most of that code, is sitting here in the, um, in the window. So you can grab that URL. And again, if you hit this down arrow and then you hit that fork button, it will give you a copy of it in your own replet and you can play with it and change the code around and hit run and see what happens if you want to try making some things private or public or setting things to static or not static and then trying to change them. So I hope this helps remind you of all of the object-oriented stuff and uh, we'll talk soon.